consider supporting Archaea Soup on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Link available in video description. Thank you. Hello, and welcome back to Storytime at Archeo Soup Towers. Today I want to continue, and indeed finish, the tale of Branwen Verch Llyr, uh, Branwen the daughter of Llyr. And I want to, to start this second concluding part with a little bit of information about the origin of this tale. Now, I've lifted these notes essentially from Wikipedia, but they are accurate, and so if the wording is familiar, this is the reason. Um, Branwen, daughter of Llyr, is the, the second branch of four branches of what is known as the Mabinogion, or Mabinogi. I'll come, come back to that in just a second. Um, they come from an oral tradition in the 11th century, uh, so the 1200s, uh, and they survived in written form in books that were in, essentially, aristocratic family libraries. Uh, two uh, particular sources are, are, are most famous. Uh, the first one being uh, the Red Book of Her Guest, or Fifa Koch Her Guest, uh, written between 1382 and 1410, and also the White Book of Rydech, uh, Fifa Gwyn Rydech, um, written around 13. Um, however, says here, scholars agree that the tales are older than the existing manuscripts, but they disagree over just how much older they are. They're often commonly put into that sort of post-Roman kind of world. They're sort of wrapped up with stories of King Arthur and this kind of thing. Uh, but they may even be older than that. I mean, I've hinted previously that some of these tales may be as old as the Bronze Age. It's hard to know with oral traditions just how old uh, tales actually are. But uh, they were definitely gathered together later on in, in their life, um, or more recently, in the sort of a, particularly in the 19th century, they, gath they gathered steam. And I'll talk about that in a future video, I think. But briefly, a word on, uh, on the word Mabinogi, or Mabinogion. Ding, 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 fight! Um, the form Mabinogion occurs once at the end of the... Uh, the f under the first of the four branches in one manuscript. So at the end of one of the, 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 the branching tales, the word Mabinogion is used in one source. Uh, it is now generally agreed that this one instance was a medieval scribal error which assumed that Mabinogion was the plural of Mabinogi, uh, following a sort of a Latinate a romance uh, sort of uh, linguistic form, which fits in, if you remember, with what I was saying last time about how people when they when they were translating these Welsh tales into English would sort of Shakespeareify or Latinize these things and make them a bit a bit more florid than really was required for the, the story to be told. This is also part of a movement in the English language at the time to try and make it conform to the rules of Latin. You know, the, the uh, Latin was high academia, it was it was intelligent, it was you know, so on and so forth. So things like, yeah, uh, you, you may have heard in Star Trek, you know, to, to boldly go is splitting the infinitive. Uh, it should be good to go boldly, this kind of thing. Well, these rules don't actually apply to English, really. But there was an attempt to do that because everything had to be, had to be more, well, elevated. It had to be more Roman-like, more, uh, more um, I suppose, actually connected to, yeah, with, with church traditions with high medieval literature and language and, and these sorts of things. So this question of Mabinogi Mabinogion is very interesting to me because I grew up, obviously, uh, as I said last time, I, I, the first instance of the Mabinogion that I read was, was this, the book that I'm reading from today and indeed last time. But, but adults around me would call it the Mabinogi because Mabinogi is already plural. It doesn't have to have eon on the end. Um, the word Mabinogi itself is something of a puzzle. Although clearly derived from the Welsh Mab, which means son, uh, boy or young person. Mab, fab, these are sort of mutations of the same word. Um, uh, Eric P. Hamp of the earlier school traditions in mythology found a suggestive connection with Maponos, the divine son, a Gaulish deity. 
That's interesting. But ultimately, we don't quite know what Mabinogion means or what Mabinogi means. Um, a word on, on Branwen herself, actually, as well. You may recall that um, uh, Bendigade Bran or Bendigade Bran, Bendigade Bran um, means uh, Bran the Blessed or the Blessed Crow slash Raven, the Blessed Raven. Well, Branwen is Raven or Crow and White. So she is the White Raven or the White Crow. Um, uh, well, actually, Wen and Gwyn are related as well. So Hlifa Gwyn Hrydech, the White Book of Hrydech, um, is, is the same sort of word. Gwyn, Wen. Uh, there's also actually a character in in Welsh mythology that, that <laughs> it sounds a bit strange out of context, but it's, it, she's called Henwen. And Henwen is a, well, uh, it means old white, but she is the pig. She's a pig. She's a bit, she's a mythical old white pig. Um, so we, we, we may even hear about her in a future episode. So Hen, um, no, no, not Hen, sorry, Hen is old. Wen, Gwyn, uh, Branwen. Uh, the White Raven. So, so Branwen is is related to Bran. There go my notes. Um, who is also known as the Raven or the Crow. But Branwen is the White Raven. Anyway, Bing. That's that's the that's the housekeeping, the history, and the origins out of the way. And now let us continue our tale from uh, Tales of uh, the Mabino from the Mabinogion by Gwyn Thomas and Kevin Crossley Holland, with illustrations by Margaret. Jones, and you may recall last uh, last last issue, last issue, last episode, we left off with uh, Branwen imprisoned in a tower, having sent um, a, a, a hail Mary, having sent a message as a last ditch effort to get in touch with someone across the waters, across the Irish Sea, in Wales. So here we go. <sighs> the bird reached the island of Britain, the island of the mighty, and found Bendigade Bran, Bran the Blessed, in council at Caer St. Arvon. The starling settled on his shoulder and ruffled its feathers. Then the king's followers saw the letter and realised the bird was in fact a tame one. They untied and read the letter. It was a very well-trained bird. Branwen had skill, clearly. Um, <laughs> Uh, and tied and read the letter, and when he heard it, Bendigade Vran was deeply moved by his sister's account of her punishment. He immediately sent out messengers to gather together warriors of the island. The king ordered the warriors of 154 regions to come to him and complain to them himself about his sister's punishment, which itself is quite an amusing idea, isn't it? Everyone come gather to me now! I'm very annoyed. <laughs> um, then a council was held. The king and his warriors resolved to go to Ireland and to leave seven men in charge of the Island of the Mighty. Uh, and Car Caradog, son of Bran, was their leader. So Bran the Blessed and his army set sail for Ireland. Bendigade Bran himself waded through the water. For at the time the sea was not so wide as it is today. It was just the width of two rivers. Interesting. Llí and Arcan. Hmm. And the king walked on towards Ireland, carry carrying all the harpists on his back. You've got to keep those harpists dry, haven't you? Madaluch, king of Ireland, uh, his swineherds were, were by the seashore one day, looking after their pigs. When they saw this wonder, at once they went to Madaluch. My lord, they said, greetings to you. God go with you, he said. What news have you? Strange news, my lord. We've seen trees standing out at sea where we never saw a single tree before. That is strange, said he. Could you see anything else? Yes, my lord, they answered. A great mountain near the trees, a moving mountain. It had a high ridge and a lake on either side of it. And the trees and the mountain and everything else were moving. Hmm, said, said Madaluch. No one here will know about these things unless Branwen does. Ask her. The messengers went to Branwen. My lady, they said, what do you think these things are? Though I'm not a lady any more, said Branwen, I know what they are. The men of the Island of the Mighty coming over the sea. They must have heard my, of my punishment and shame, she said. 
What are the trees we saw on the sea? they asked. Masts of ships and yard arms, she answered. Oh, they said. And what about the mountain near the trees? they asked. That is my brother, she said. Bran the Blessed, Bendigade Bran himself, she answered. He's wading through the shallows. There's no ship, you see, that can hold him. What of the high ridge with the lakes on either side of it? they asked. Well, she said, uh, <laughs> Ben de Gabran, she said, glaring at this island, uh, the two lakes uh, and the ridge are his eyes and nose, glaring back at you. <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 clearly the swineherds were shocked by that. Then Matholoch and his followers swiftly summoned all the warriors of Ireland and held a council. My lord, said his nobleman, there's only one wise thing we can do, retreat over the river Shannon leaving the river be between him and you, then destroy the bridge. Simple as that. There are lodestones in the riverbed which will drag down any vessel. Neither ship nor craft nor raft can get across that river. And so they retreated across the river and destroyed the bridge. After a while, Bendigade Bran and his fleet reached land near the bank of this river. My lord, said his nobleman. To ben There's lots of my lord in this, isn't there? Said to, uh, to Bran the Blessed. You've heard about this strange river no one can cross, the Shannon, and there's no bridge over it. How are we supposed to get over it? they asked. There's nothing for it, he said, but for your leader to be a bridge. I shall be a bridge. And there's a wonderful picture here uh, of, uh, of what's about to happen. Bendigay Bran laid himself across the river, and his warriors crossed over him. As soon as he stood up, messengers came to him and brought him greetings from Madaluch, his kinsman. Madaluch, they said, is giving the kingship of Ireland uh, uh, to his son Gwern, uh, to your sister's son. Uh, he wants to crown him in your presence as compensation for the wrong and the insult inflicted on Branwen. Please don't hurt us. <laughs> um, wherever you wish, here on the island or, or on the island of the mighty, uh, back in Britain, if you want to go back to Britain, um, make, thing, uh, make things ready for Madaluch and, and, and he, will, he will see it done. Yes, said Bendigade Bran. Well, if I'm not to have this crown for myself, I must ask my warriors for their opinion of your offer to give it to my, uh, it would be his, what, well, his nephew, I suppose, to my nephew. So first, improve it, then I'll say yes or no. Go and improve your offer. We understand, they said. We'll bring you back the best offer we can get. Just wait here until we come back. I'll wait, he said, if you come quickly. Away went the messengers, and they came to Madaluch. My lord, they said, make Bendigabran a better offer. He paid very little heed of the first one. Hmm, well then, said Madaluch, what's your advice? My lord, they said, there's only one thing to do. There has never been a house large enough to hold Bran the Blessed. Build a, ho a house in his honour, a house that will hold him and his men of the Island of the Mighty in one half, and you and your, and your warriors in the other half. You must also give him your crown and do homage to him. Then, because of your honour, uh, of having a house that will hold him, a, a thing he's never had before, he'll make peace with you, surely. So the messengers returned to Bran the Blessed with this offer. And then the king held a council and decided to accept the King of Ireland's offer. And this all came about because Branwen's advice. She did not want the whole country to be ravaged. So even though she's been punished and slapped in the face by a butcher every morning, and uh, she's uh, been, been humiliated, she, she gave advice and helped to try and foster some sort of peace. Peace was indeed agreed. And that was a nice rhyme, wasn't it? Was indeed agreed. And the house built was big and beautiful. But the Irish played a trick on the men of Britain. Oh, typical. Typical. People always playing tricks on each other. They hammered a long nail into both sides of every one of the hundred pillars in the house and hung a skin bag, a belly, in quotes, a belly on every nail. And they hid a, um, an armed warrior in every one of those those bags. Oh. Ethnician, the slimy uh, the slimy character from the beginning of the story, Evnissian entered the house in advance of the warriors of the Island of the Mighty and looked around him with blazing eyes, burning with anger. Then he saw the bellies hanging on the piers and asked, What's in this belly? 
he asked one of the Irishmen. Flour, my friend. Nothing, nothing but flour. Just, it's a bag full of flour on the wall. Just don't, just don't look at it. Don't, it, it, it's not worth your attention. Evnissian prodded the flour until he got hold of a warrior's head. He squeezed it until he felt his fingers sinking through the skull into the brains. Ugh. Then he turned, put his hand on another belly and asked, what's in this one then? Because that wasn't flour. <laughs> Flour, said the Irishman. Evnissian fingered every single bag and the heads inside them so that there was only one man left alive out of the two hundred. He came to the last one and asked, What? Presumably with a very wet hand now. What's in this bag then? Tell me. What is here? Uh, flour, my friend, said the Irishman. I don't know how this guy's still alive, if he keeps on lying to a man who's crushing people's skulls, skulls with his bare hands. Um, <clears throat> once again, Evnissian felt it until he had found the head, and as he had squeezed the other heads, he squeezed this one too. He could feel a helmet on this warrior's head, but that did not stop him from killing the man. Then Evnissian sang. Mm, okay. In these bellies are all sorts of flowers, men savage in war, soldiers too, and warriors. For battle they were ready, so various sorts of flowers. Okay, interesting song. For battle they're ready, these various sorts of flowers. Interestingly, um, the Aztecs called uh, their, their conflicts with their neighbours flowery wars. Uh, because the uh, the the the, the um, machatels the or machatels the, uh, the the obsidian bladed weapons that they would use to slash at their enemies wouldn't necessarily kill they would maim uh, the idea was to take prisoners for sacrifice but the blood left behind on the field to them would look a bit like you know poppies or something you know red flowers on the grass flowery wars so I wonder if uh, these flowers were um, were red. Anyway, at this moment, hundreds of people crowded into the house. The men of the island of Ireland came into the house on one side, and the men of the island of Britain, of the, well, the island of the mighty, so-called, the island of Britain, came in on the other. As soon as they had sat down, there was an accord between... Well, how was there an accord? Evanissians just caught them, trying to load the place with warriors ready to attack. Or maybe they were ready to defend. Maybe they weren't going to attack. Maybe they were just there in case it kicked off. But... Anyway, as soon as they sat down, there was an accord between Bran the Blessed and, and Madaluch, and the boy Gwern was crowned king. Uh, this is the son of Madaluch and Branwen. Then, after arrangements for peace had been completed, Bran the Blessed called the boy to him. From him, Gwern passed to Man Manoidan, that's uh, Bran's brother, I think, uh, and everyone who saw him made a fuss of him. Then Nissian called the boy to him from Manoidan, and he went graciously. Why, why, said if Nissian, does my nephew, my sister's son, not come to me? Probably because you're covered in blood, of Nissian, but anyway. Even if he were not, <laughs> sorry, even if he were not king of Ireland, I'd be glad to get to know him. Go to him in friendship, said Bran the Blessed, and the boy went gladly. I swear to God, thought Ednissian, I'll be the cause now of a disaster no one here expects. <laughs> then Ednissian stood up, took the boy by his feet, and before anyone in the hall could move to stop him, threw the boy headfirst into the blazing fire. Wow. When Branwen saw her own child burning, she tried to leap up from her seat between the two brothers into the fire, but Bendigate Bran held her with one hand and picked up his shield with the other. And then everyone in the house got up. The uproar was the greatest that a crowd ever made in any house as everyone went to their weapons. It is kicking off, isn't it? And while the others reached for their weapons, Bran the Blessed held Branwen between his shield and his shoulder. And then the Irish began to kindle a fire under the cauldron of rebirth. And they threw the bodies of their dead into the cauldron. All the dead had been squished by Evnissian into the cauldron until it was full. The following morning, those warriors came out of the cauldron as fit and strong as they had ever been, except that they could not speak, if you recall from part one. 
Amnesian saw that there were so many corpses of men of the islands of the mighty that there was no room for them anywhere else. Alas, he thought, <laughs> I've been the cause of this pile of the dead of the island of the mighty. And shame on me, he thought, if I do not try to save my people. Then Evnissian buried himself among the dead bodies of the Irish, and two Irishmen, stripped to the waist, came and threw him into the cauldron, taking him to be an Irishman. Evnissian stretched himself into the cauldron. He stretched until he broke it into four pieces, and his heart broke too because of the strain. It was because of this that men of the Island of the Mighty gained a victory in that battle, despite the cauldron bringing the Irish back to life such as it was. Only seven men escaped alive, and Bran the Blessed was with them, wounded in the foot with a poisoned spear. And these seven men were Prideri, Manoidan, uh, Glyphiai, son of Taran, Taleisin, Taleisin's a very famous name, uh, I think it's, it is a bard, he is the bard, isn't he? Taleisin, um, Una, 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 this is a hard one. Unaug, 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 unaug. I'm going to leave this in. Unaug, yeah, unaug. <laughs> uh, Grithiai, son of Muriel, and Halen, son of Gwyn the Old. Then Bran the Blessed ordered the seven of them to cut off his head. And just to be clear, cut off his own head. Can you cut off my head? He asked. And take the head, he said, and carry it to the White Hill in London, and bury it with its face towards France. And you, you'll be a long time on the road. You'll stay at Harlech, feasting for seven years, with the birds of Rhiannon singing to you. And the head will keep you just as good a company as it did when it was between my shoulders. Then you will stay in Gwales, in Pemfro, for eight years, and until you open the door at Gwales, which looks towards Aberhenvelen in Cornwall, you'll be able to stay there, and the head, none the worse, shall be with you. So she, but presumably his head won't spoil on the journey. But from the moment you open the door, you cannot remain there. Go to London and bury my head, he said, and now set out for the island of the mighty. Then Bran the Blessed's head was indeed cut off. And the seven men with the head, taking Branwen as an eighth, set out for the island of the mighty. They reached land at Abar Alau, and sat down to rest. Branwen looked back at Ireland, and having reached the island of the mighty, she let out a great sigh. Woe is me that ever I was born, she said. The good of two islands has been destroyed because of me. <laughs> why, why, why is she taking the blame? Oh man, it wasn't you. It wasn't you, Bran. When it was, it was them. Uh, anyway, um, then Bran when gave out a great sigh, and her heart broke, and a grave was made for her on the banks of the Alau where she fell. Oh dear, poor, poor Bran when. After that, the seven men went towards Harlech as instructed by by Bran before his head was cut off taking the head with them and a company of men and women came out to meet them have you any news asked Manoidan only this they replied Kaz Wathlon son of Beli has conquered the island of the mighty and is now king in London oh blimey now Beli is another figure who's interesting yeah anyway I'll probably talk about him in the future as well and, what's ha and what happened, asked the seven, to Caradog, son of Bran, and those men uh, left with him on this island? Well, uh, Caswathlon surprised and killed six of them, they said, and Caradog's heart broke, for he could see a sword striking his men, but did not know who wielded, wielded it. Caswathlon was wearing a magical cloak, you see. He was invisible, and no one could see him striking the men. All they could see was his sword. And Caswathlon did not want to kill Caradog because he was the son of, of his cousin. Wow, so Caswathlon is Bran's cousin. Crikey. It's all it's all you know it's all uh, interconnected. 
Then the seven warriors went to Harlech and stayed there, and they started to eat. And as soon as they had started to eat, three birds came and began to sing them a song. And every song they had ever heard was, oh dear, and every song they had ever heard was unpleasant compared to this singing. Okay, that's much better. The men had to gaze far out over the waves to catch sight of the birds, and yet their singing was so clear it was as if they were overhead. And they stayed there feasting for seven years. Feasting for seven years. Imagine that. At the end of the seventh year, the seven warriors set out for Gwales in Pembro. A fair royal palace had been prepared for them there, overlooking the sea. It was a great hall, and they went into that hall, and they could see two doors open, and a third door was shut. That was the door facing Cornwall. Do you see that? said Manoi then. That is the door we are not to open. That evening they lacked neither for food nor drink nor talk nor song. They were happy together. Despite the great sorrow and suffering they had seen and themselves enjoy endured, they had no memory of it or of any grief. So I suppose after seven years you know, of feasting, you're going to be, you know, the, the pain will dull, I guess, over time. They remained there for 80 years. Not eight, 80 years. None of them thought uh, he had ever spent time in a more pleasant or delightful manner. Every year was as happy as the first, and from each other's appearance, none of them could have guessed he had been there for so long. So they stayed young and feasted for 80 years. And to have, ha to, to have the head with them that was no less pleasant than when Bendigade Vran was himself alive, so that the head itself didn't. It didn't decay over time. But this was what Halion, one of the seven, did one day. Shame on me, he said. If I don't open that door and find out if what is said about it is true. So Halion opened the door and looked towards Cornwall, Aberhen Velen. Relatives and friends that they had lost and all evil as, that had happened to them were as clear to them as if they, it had just occurred. They'd opened the door on their memories, presumably, on the past. And the memory of their lord, Bran the Blessed, Bendigade Bran, was most painful of all. And from that time they could not remain there, but set out for London, taking the head with them. At last they reached London and buried the head in a white hill. And this is how this branch of the Mabinogi ends. Now, it, it might be a little bit hard to follow some of the stuff that happened there. But that sequence of events from uh, the battle that's kind of slightly skipped over, we go from a description of the Irish being chucked into the cauldron to seemingly piles of dead dead British in the hall. That is, I think, that's a battle that happens you know, sort of between the lines. Um, but then the the important thing here is that, that Bran, in some versions of the tale, not only continues his head continues to be in fairly good condition, but actually he continues to be quite talkative in some versions. And uh, and the, the significance of him saying, this is where you'll go, this is what you'll do, uh, and, and this is where I'm going to end up, is very, well, it's very important to remember in the context of his name, Bran, uh, meaning raven or crow. You see, part of the legend that's not quite not quite hinted at there is that the, the white mountain the white hill uh that, he, that he's buried in in london is actually the mound on which eventually the tower of london would be built and so you may well have heard the tradition at the tower of london that, that if the ravens ever leave the tower the kingdom of england or yeah what's it, the kingdom of britain will will fall and it's this connection it's the fact that that, that according to tradition bran's head the giant's head is in the mound looking towards France or to the south, to where perhaps enemies might come from. And his presence is is the foundation for the the founding of what would come next. Namely, indeed, even apparently, the Normans when they built the Tower of London. So it's an interesting connection there. And, and it's slightly, the tale sort of gathers pace and it's slightly brushed over, I think, in that version, in that telling. But uh, the, the, the idea of this, this, this head that continues to be quite jovial, you know, quite pleasant, um, and, uh, and eventually is buried in that hill, is, is an interesting connection. And it's one that, as a child, I found, I found very inspiring. The notion that, uh, that, that even 
down in London, you know, the southeast of England, there was a there was a, a, a source of power, a source of of um, of kingship, of giant prowess that came from my little North Wales was was a source of great pride for me. It, it, you know, it's a tale, it's a story, but it's a connection between the ancient British, I suppose, and and I guess the Saxons, and then the the the, the monarchy that came after that, and uh, and so on and so forth. So it's an interesting one. If the ravens at the Tower of London ever leave, doom is 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 upon us. And this is because of Bran the Blessed, or Bendigade Bran himself. And there we go. The the story of Branwen, tragedy of Branwen, really, and the uh, the the strange interactions between the the Welsh and the Irish in that tale. Hopefully you've enjoyed this story. Uh, I, there definitely there are more to tell, and I will return to them uh, soon. Thank you for watching, and until next time, do take care. Bye bye.